Two women stabbed to death at Plaza Hollywood in Diamond Hill. The heat stress at work warning issued and cancelled multiple times today. And the U.S. Senate passes a debt ceiling deal. Good evening and welcome. Two women were stabbed by a man at Plaza Hollywood in Diamond Hill in the late afternoon. The 39-year-old suspected assailant was subdued on the spot. The two women, aged 22 and 26 respectively, died in the incident. Jacqueline with more. A warning, the pictures may be disturbing. This video showed the two women on the third floor of Plaza Hollywood at around 5.30 p.m. All of a sudden, this man donning a white shirt charged towards the woman with short hair and kept striking her. Another woman tried to intervene, but to no avail. Some performed CPR on the victims. A large group of police officers with shields reached the scene. Put down your knife, an officer ordered the suspect. The suspected assailant was later subdued by the police. Blood stained tissue paper and first aid items were strewn across the floor. Investigations underway with officers inquiring workers nearby. Shops rolled down their shutters. On high alert, multiple floors of Plaza Hollywood saw contingents of officers on standby, carrying guns with pepper spray pellets. Also dispatched the counterterrorism response unit. Jacqueline, TVB News. Authorities issued the heat stress at work warning three times today, separately, within just three and a half hours. On one occasion, the warning was reissued 10 minutes after it was cancelled. Labour unions have slammed the mixed signals, saying it's difficult for the parties concerned to follow the guidelines. It's another hot day, and today the Labour Department issued the Amber Heat Stress at Work warning on three different occasions. The first one was at 11.50 a.m. The warning was cancelled two hours later, and ten minutes after that, it was put up again. About an hour later, it was cancelled. Twenty minutes later, the warning was reissued and remained in effect for an hour until 4.20 p.m. Under current guidelines, when the amber heat stress at work warning is in effect, those working outdoors, such as construction workers, should be allowed to take a 15-minute break for each 45 minutes of work. This woman said, the resting room and our workplace are far away, so it's quite chaotic when I was told the warning was dropped once I sat down and was going to take a rest. A construction association said the guidelines are simply not working. It's just confusions and uncertainties. The guidance looks impractical, if not impossible, to practice. So today is a very good example. You can imagine what kind of hassles that will be created on the construction sites. So it will delay the whole process and make the uh, cost of the construction rising up. It's no good for the whole industry and the society at all. The Hong Kong Construction Industry Employees General Union, meanwhile, thinks the authorities should not repeatedly cancel and reissue signals within a short period of time, as that would make it hard for supervisors and employees to follow the guidelines. From January to May, more than 10 million tourists visited the city. The number of holiday makers over the Labor Day Golden Week also returned to two-thirds of pre-pandemic levels. But the city also witnessed a surge in complaints from visitors, especially on their dining experiences. Industry representatives admit their quality of customer service has declined in general, and that's largely due to manpower shortages. Jacqueline with more. From the breathtaking skyline to bustling food stalls, Hong Kong has been touted as a shopping and culinary paradise, welcoming tourists from all corners of the world. But that stature might be marred by a surge in posts on mainland social media platforms, lamenting the city's poor service and rudeness towards tourists. Is Hong Kong losing its allure? 
TVB reporters pose as mainland tourists and try to order food in Putonghua at this Chimsha Choi restaurant. We headed to another noodle shop in Central with Aliyah, who hails from Italy but has lived in Hong Kong for 18 years. You definitely don't feel like you're being serviced or pampered. It's very direct, very honest. <laughs> So what exactly is good customer service? Ray Choi, president of the Institute of Dining Professionals, says the key lies in putting yourself in the patron's shoes to provide the best possible experience for diners. Meanwhile, Leung chun Hua, chairman of the Association for Hong Kong Catering Services Management, admits the city's customer service has been on the decline over the past decade, especially after the pandemic. He said that's because of the manpower shortage and the industry is still seeing a shortfall of 20%. Julie Wong, chief executive of the Consumer Council, said the watchdog received 600 complaints from tourists in the first four months of 2023. Among them, 7 percent were related to quality of service. To regain the city's footing as a hospitable city, references could be taken from the government's quality tourism services scheme. More than 7,700 accredited restaurants and shops pass assessments for meeting high standards of product quality and service. But not many of them are the most popular among sightseers. Simon Wang, chairman of the scheme, said travelers might not be seeking the top quality services but special local encounters. He hopes more of these establishments will provide a better experience over time for Hong Kong to truly live up to our world city reputation. Jacqueline, TVB News. Overseas, the U.S. Senate on Thursday passed bipartisan legislation backed by President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. It suspends the government's 31.4 billion U.S. dollar debt ceiling, averting what would have been a first-ever default. It allows the U.S. government to pay its bills. Tracy Furness has more. The national debt clock, a billboard-sized running total display that shows the United States' gross national debt and each American family's share of the debt. By Thursday, it showed the national debt was over $31.4 trillion. By late Thursday, the Senate gave its approval to fend off a default and lift the debt ceiling after months of partisan bickering between Democrats and Republicans. On this vote, the yeas are 63, the nays are 36, the 60-vote threshold having been achieved, the bill is passed. The Treasury Department had warned it would be unable to pay all its debts on June 5th. Before the vote, senators tore through nearly a dozen amendments. Some Republican senators argued the bill didn't go far enough to cut spending, while Democrats said it went too far. It took centrists in both parties to pull the package to passage, sending the bill to okay, President Biden evening, to sign into law before now Monday's Democrats deadline. Tonight's vote is a good outcome because Democrats did a very good job taking the worst parts of the Republican plan off the table. And that's why Dems voted overwhelmingly for this bill, while Republicans certainly in the Senate did not. This legislation means the statutory limit on federal borrowing will be suspended until January 1, 2025. The deal will boost total defense spending to 886 billion US dollars in line with Biden's 2024 budget spending proposal. That is about a 3% increase allocated in the current budget for the Pentagon and other defense related programs. The reaction from senators was swift. This is really dumb. We put ourselves in a position where if we don't pass all the appropriation bills, the cuts negotiated by the House to non-defense are wiped out. The gains by the, uh, under this bill for the military are wiped out. So the likelihood of us doing all these bills has gone way down. The people who negotiated this, I wouldn't let them buy me a car. Tracy Furness, TVB News. 
Singapore is at the center of China-U.S. relations this weekend, with both defense chiefs there for a major security conference. It seems Li Shangfu and Lloyd Austin won't meet each other, but will speak to delegates in important policy messages. David Garrett reports. Security is tight for the security conference. There are big hitters in town for the 20th Shangri-La Dialogue. 49 countries are represented. Defence Minister Li Shangfu arrived on Thursday and early Friday met Singapore Acting Prime Minister Lawrence Wong. Welcome. Li met with his defence opposite number in Singapore yesterday. The general, who's been in the post since March, will deliver a keynote speech on Sunday. Great to see you again. US Secretary of State Lloyd Austin is also there after travelling from Japan. He was met by Singapore's Defence Minister. Washington hoped Austin and Li would meet but Beijing declined. The second question that you asked was uh, regarding declining, the, the Chinese declining uh, uh, to meet with me, uh, the Minister of Defense declining to meet with me. I, I think that's unfortunate, uh, but uh, we're going to continue to do what we are doing uh, in this region and others, and that is to work with uh, like-minded countries who, who share uh, common values. One of those countries from where the US receives unwavering support is Australia. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is in Singapore too and will deliver the first big address of the Shangri-La Dialogue. He held meetings and ceremonies before that. The US, Britain and Australia have struck agreements on nuclear submarines. Australia says it is to address the rising threat of China. But Albanese says dialogue is the key. That provides the basis for understanding and for pursuit of common interests in everyone's interests going forward, uh, which uh, are, are certainly uh, in the interests of, uh, of individual nations, but it's also in the interests of all of us. Even though there's not an official meeting between the defence chiefs of China and the US, many hope talks can be engineered on the sidelines. Austin will address the event tomorrow. He'll then move on to India, continuing to advance US partnerships across the region. Lee will have his say on Sunday. David Garrett, TVB News. The United States signed a trade agreement with Taiwan Thursday, despite opposition from Beijing. The U.S.-Taiwan initiative on 21st century trade will strengthen commercial relations by improving customs, investment and other regulations. The measure was signed by employees of a high-tech center and official entities that maintain relations between Taiwan and the U.S. The Chinese government accused Washington of violating agreements on Taiwan status. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said the United States should stop any form of official exchanges with Taiwan and refrain from sending wrong signals to the Taiwan Independence Secessionist Forces. Still ahead on tonight's news. Ukraine's president rallies for support at a European political community summit in Moldova. In the US, President Joe Biden falls on stage at an Air Force Academy graduation. And a campaign to brighten the mood of Hong Kong people with the return of the iconic duck. Welcome back to TVB News. Ukrainian forces in Kyiv said on Friday they shot down 36 Russian missiles and drones in and around the capital overnight. Two people were injured by falling debris before authorities lifted air raid alerts across most of Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky once again rallied for political support and security backing from NATO at a summit in Moldova where nearly every European leader had assembled. Dan Orell tells us more. A Ukrainian Air Force statement said its air defenses had shot down 15 cruise missiles and 21 drones around Kyiv. It said a wave of drones had been launched late on Thursday, followed by a volley of cruise missiles as people slept at around 3 a.m. local time. The capital's military authorities praised Kyiv's air defenses and said there were no reports of casualties in the capital. Kyiv Mayor Vitaly Klitschko, who earlier reported two separate waves of attacks, wrote on Telegram that there had been no calls for rescue services. In the region outside the Ukrainian capital, authorities said two people, including a child, were injured as a result of falling debris. 
Russian officials reported more cross-border shelling from Ukraine on Friday. They said two long-range drones had attacked fuel and energy infrastructure further north in Russia, but that no fires or injuries were reported there. Elsewhere, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky attended a European political community summit in Moldova. He told the attendees that the best way to guarantee Ukraine's security is for the nation to become a member of NATO and the European Union. He said any proposed peace plans to end the 15-month-old war in his country could not take into account Russian concerns. NATO. Zelensky said that during a NATO summit scheduled for July in Lithuania, a clear invitation for Ukraine to join the bloc is needed. He added Ukraine also needs a clear positive decision on its accession to the EU in autumn. The Ukrainian president urged a continuation of Western military aid to Ukraine, saying it was saving lives and literally accelerating peace. French President Emmanuel Macron, the instigator behind the European Political Community Summit, supported Zelensky's appeal. Danarel, TVB News. China's Eurasian Affairs envoy Li Hui, who toured European capitals last month seeking to promote Ukraine peace talks, said today that Beijing is considering another such mission. At a news conference, Li rejected a media report saying he promoted a ceasefire that would leave Russia occupying parts of Ukraine. He stated there are high hurdles to finding common ground between the warring sides. Li said the risk of escalation of the Russia-Ukraine war is still high, adding that all sides must take concrete measures to cool down the situation and ensure the safety of nuclear facilities. The envoy added, as long as it's conducive to easing the situation, China is willing to do anything. U.S. President Joe Biden quipped that he got sandbagged after he tripped and fell while on stage at the U.S. Air Force Academy graduation in Colorado Springs. Two small black sandbags had been on stage supporting the teleprompter used by the president at the graduation. Biden had been greeting the graduates at the front of the stage with salutes and handshakes. He turned to jog back towards his seat when he took a tumble. The president was helped to his feet by an Air Force officer, as well as two members of his U.S. Secret Service detail. Onlookers watched in concern before Biden returned to his seat to view the end of the ceremony. At the age of 80, Biden is the oldest president in U.S. history. The White House's communications director tweeted that the president was fine following the incident. Back locally, customs offices have seized suspected counterfeit and infringing goods with an estimated market value of over $44 million. During a two-week operation last month, customs officers searched 30 divanning areas and found these suspected counterfeit watches, handbags and sports shoes. Authorities say the suspects made use of remote locations to store these products before shipping them to Europe, Africa and the Middle East. Officers also said the location is extremely private and hard to get to. Meanwhile, customs officers also busted two cases related to copyright infringement. The cases involved the sale of Blu-ray discs worth over $87,000 at a shop in Mong Kok. Two truck drivers and the shop operator were arrested. The iconic giant rubber duck will make its grand comeback in Victoria Harbour next Saturday. Actually, two of them this time round. To celebrate the upcoming event, the MTR has begun exhibiting an assortment of rubber duck designs, icons and digital displays in a number of stations across the city. Timothy Lee tells us more. Instead of the usual vibrational hum of incoming trains, residents can hear a loud quack at Admiralty Station today. Images of ducks and a sea of yellow could be seen everywhere at the station, from its giant glass dome to the station's walls and stairs. After its last appearance in the SAR a decade ago, the iconic giant rubber duck, created by Dutch artist Florentine Hoffman, will grace the city once again next Saturday in Victoria Harbour. Known as the Double Ducks Exhibition, many came to Admiralty Station today just to take photos and even strike a pose. No, it's quite eye-catching. I heard it's in the harbour at Tamar from next week. I just come here to, to take photos and I, I feel it's funny. It's funny, they're cute, they're cute. I, uh, because I've ever been to uh, 10 years ago, I've been here. And, and now after 10 years, I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a already a fan 10 years ago. I think the promotion is so good. 
The MTR and the exhibition's organizer, All Rights Reserved, said they hoped the public art installations in the city's public transport system would brighten the mood of Hong Kongers. In Tier 1-3, uh, we are happy to bring the uh, rubber duck to Victoria Harbour to share joy with Hong Kong people. This year is the 10 years anniversary of rubber duck project. We are happy to bring it back to Hong Kong to share the double happiness. The organizer added that the artist behind the giant rubber duck will personally attend the Saturday event to meet with local fans. MTR passengers will currently be able to find different rubber duck designs across 18 stations. It is part of a joint effort by the MTR and All Rights Reserved to showcase unique characteristics and landmarks of various regions in Hong Kong. Timothy Lee, TVB News. That's the news. Thanks for watching.